everyone. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint podcast. I am Ari Witten, as usual, and uh, I'm with Dr. Spencer Nadalski, who uh, is someone that I've actually followed for several years now, and I'm a big fan of his work. He is board certified in family medicine, and he is a specialist in obesity medicine. And he's the author of The Fat Loss Prescription. He's done a whole bunch of work uh, within the realm of fat loss and a lot of myth debunking around nutrition and exercise myths and fat loss myths. And he just, he just does awesome work. And uh, I wanted to have him on the show. So welcome, Dr. Nadolsky. Thanks for having me, buddy. Yeah. So I think a good place to, to get into this discussion because um, body composition is so relevant and insulin resistance is so relevant to fatigue and it's such a common thing that overlaps with fatigue. I think it would be nice to kind of just intro with maybe some of, of that link, some of that kind of how those things overlap, how metabolic syndrome and diabetes tend to, to overlap and how they impact metabolic function in a way that, you know, maybe can result in, in fatigue. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good uh, topic. Uh, and it's, you know, a lot of, most of my patients have some sort of insulin resistance, if I had to guess. And so it is a big deal because most of my patients feel some sort of fatigue and there is an overlap. So, you know, most people thought that in the past, I don't know, early 1900s, mid 1900s, all the way up till maybe even still now today, that fat is just a storage depot, you know, something that looks unsightly, a condition of laziness per se and that people just don't have willpower, right? And that's, that's what most people think. And so, you know, when, when most physicians, when a patient who we say has overweight or has obesity, uh, we don't give them that title. We don't label them as that condition. You know, some, an obese patient, most people would say, I say has obesity. They come into the door of a normal physician and physician will just say, you know, you just need to eat less and move more. You're fatigued because, you know, the, they may even call them fat if they're, you know, not being very sensitive, but they don't understand the underlying pathophysiology of obesity and how complex it is. You know, I, I, you know, you and I are both in these kind of overlapping circles, but I'm kind of in this world of fitness professionals and physicians who a lot of people just think you just need to eat less and move more, which is true from a from a physiological standpoint but it's a lot harder to actually make that happen and the the complexities that go behind how hard it is to actually do the eating less and, and moving more is is uh really substantial so so most people so like i said most people think it's a storage depot you know fat but as of late, you know, we're starting to find it's probably our biggest endocrine organ, right? So uh, instead of people thinking, you know, our pancreas and all these things, our thyroid, our endocrine organs, we, we actually now know that our fat secretes all sorts of things, cytokines or adipokines, as people would say. So specifically, you know, that belly fat, the stuff that's uh, maybe that you can't really pinch, not the what they call subcutaneous fat, but the visceral fat or even the the liver fat, the stuff that surrounds your organs that kind of gives you that bigger waist circumference, that stuff specifically, specifically is metabolically pretty bad. And so I, I, I imagine on your podcast, I haven't listened to many of them, but you probably talk about some of these cytokines and inflammatory things that are going on. So you can imagine someone with excess weight, especially around their, their abdomen, this big endocrine organ that's secreting a lot of these adipokines causing all sorts of inflammation that's also actually interacting with your cells and and possibly causing some you know cellular respiration issues and all sorts of things from a macro lens though a patient comes in with uh, some excess weight there's all sorts of things that could be causing the, the fatigue and, and overlaps though and that's kind of me as a physician trying to look at it from that lens mm -hmm. um, uh, we, and we can get into that if you want. But. Yeah, well, I mean, so one of the biggest factors that I definitely talk about is the link between inflammation and, and chronic fatigue. And there's mm -hmm. a whole bunch of mechanisms by which yeah. inflammation can cause chronic fatigue. Um, and I, you know, just for people who, who didn't quite catch it or are unfamiliar with the terminology, these cytokines or adipokines that uh, Dr. Nadolsky is referring to and kind of this endocrine organ. What this means is that your fat is actually like a hormone producing organ. 
um, in the same way that your thyroid and your pancreas are. And in addition to that, produces inflammatory cytokines, things that, that cause chronic inflammation in the body. Um, and there's well-known mechanisms that we know that that inflammation can impact certain brain areas that regulate energy levels and so on. Um, so with that in mind, with kind of that, this, this context of how body composition or being overweight can, uh, having overweight, <laughs> then, it's a, uh, it sounds weird. It's, that actually sounds the most weird. Having obesity makes sense. Having overweight is actually tough for me to say, although I'm supposed to say it, but yeah. Yeah, I agree. It, it sounds odd. It's a little bit odd. <laughs> yeah, but it's, I, I agree. It's a better way of saying it. So um, having said that, we understand this, this context of how that relates to, you know, potentially causing fatigue. Mm -hmm. Let's get into some of the kind of the meat around fat loss. Why are people gaining fat? I guess let's start there. Uh, because I know there's there's a ton of misconceptions that that people have in the lay public around the causes of fat gain in the first place. So yeah. let's let's get into that. Do some myth debunking around that. And and first of all, I guess I should say, is obesity caused by simply gluttony and sloth? Is it is it just a choice? Is it somebody who's just being lazy and and eating too much? Right. So you know when you. Even if I look at my elementary school pictures from, you know, late 80s, early 90s, and you compare them to, you know, the, the elementary school kids now in the, you know, 2010s, there's, there's been a shift. And what's, what's changed? Our genetics haven't really changed, but our environment has. And you can't, you know, I'm not just going to blame it all on our environment, but there's a mismatch going on. So there, there's a good quote that basically genetics and even epigenetics uh, load the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. So uh, clearly some sort of mismatch has come on in the past, you know, 20, 30 years that's really accelerated the obesity. And so, you know, everybody wants to point the finger at one little thing. When it comes down to it from a physiological level, there is a mismatch of, of excess energy uh, being taken in versus going out. So from that macro lens or whatever you want to say is, Yes, we are we are eating more, and so we need to eat less somehow. But it's it's much more it's much more complicated than that. And so I, you know, this whole is obesity a choice? Well, you know, I, I think we have less choice in it than we really think because of how our bodies are driven to wanting to eat more uh, and, and our appetite. So with that excess, so first, if you're if you're lean and you're lucky enough to have a lean family. You may never, you know, despite your environment, you may never become or get overweight or, or obesity. But if you have, if you're one of the unlucky ones who has a, a genetic, you know, predisposition to gaining a little bit of excess weight, you're going to have to try a little bit harder to not do that. And it's going to be a lot easier in the environment. And then once you actually gain the weight because of all these adipokines, these hormonal changes and the free fatty acids causing all sorts of inflammation, that actually has an effect on your brain to make it even harder to then lose the weight and keep it off. And we can get into the nuances of that. So, you know, I talk about, I have a little blog and I, I think you were reading it about, is obesity a choice? It's not, this isn't supposed to be a question that's supposed to be answered. It's, no, it's not a choice. You have no choice. Of course we have choices. Of course we can change things and, and, and specifically choose certain foods in the moment. But when you start taking a step back and you start looking at all the driving factors making us gain weight, it's kind of like, holy cow, how do, how do some of these people even stand a chance? So in it, I talk about like, you know, uh, I always talk about Steve and Joe's mom. You know, Steve's mom, she exercised uh, during pregnancy and um, uh, stayed a, a normal weight, uh, gained appropriate amount of weight for, for her pregnancy and ate mostly vegetables, some lean proteins, some lean dairies, you know, maybe some legumes, and, and she was very active, right? Then there's Joe's mom, who was very sedentary, ate a ton of fast food, gained way more weight than she was supposed to during her, her pregnancy, and uh, um, uh, both of them had babies. Steve was of normal weight, um, and then Joe was large for gestation. Now we know, and I'm sure you've talked about epigenetics and metabolic programming. So what, what our mothers did while we were in utero, and maybe even our grandparents and our fathers, um, that has an effect on how our genes are expressed uh, you know, later in life. It's, kind of, it's like, so was that a choice? Was that our choice? 
necessarily. And now so some people will say, well, that's just a small contributor. Well, when then we start adding more and more things in, like whether you're breastfed or not. Uh, and again, that was not necessarily um, the choice of our mothers either. But they may, may didn't, didn't have a good milk supply. The blog that I made, a lot of mo you know, moms came out like, you're mommy shaming. I'm like, no, I promise. I understand people have trouble breastfeeding. Maybe the baby didn't latch. Maybe you just didn't have a good milk supply. But these may be some small factors. Some people uh, argue that, that biological plausibility in there. Whether you had a C-section or vaginal uh, delivery may have an effect. And I'm sure you've probably looked at some of that, you know, coming out with the, the hypothalamic um, pituitary adrenal access of, of coming through the birth canal may have shaped our that, that initial stress when we came out um, into life that may have um, that may have programmed us in some sort of way maybe there's the the difference in their microbiome because of our the, our mother's vaginal flora whereas with a c-section we came out sterilely uh, that may have an effect again these are all maybe small little contributors but things we never had a choice about well yeah, just to interject real quick, just to point out to everyone listening, all of those factors that, that he just mentioned are all things that are occurring like uh, before you're even born and in the first year of life. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the, you just listed off what, eight different factors that, will, that, are, that are proven to affect later risk of, of having overweight or obesity yep. just within the first year you're born. So it's you know, it's hard to say that it's your choice or your willpower or anything to do with your laziness or gluttony right. when you have like eight different variables that are influencing this before you are even conscious enough to make a choice. Yep. So then, and so then you go on as you're growing up, you know, maybe your parents, you know, one of them has to work an extra job. So you're, you're with the other parent and, and, and the one parent has to just order pizza because they're working late and they're tired and maybe they're you know they have obesity they have sleep apnea so they're sleeping on the couch that's what i show in the cartoon whereas you know steve's family they're sitting at the dinner table they have fresh vegetables and and, and, and there's actually a lot of data showing your taste for for these types of foods begin very early on maybe even in utero where if you if the mother eats more vegetables the kid will actually enjoy vegetables later on in life which is crazy it's just the 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 things that you just can't control. And then, you know, maybe some of these habit things, maybe your you know, father went and worked out with you, got you um, in the sports early, whereas, you know, maybe uh, Joe, who had overweight or had obesity as a young, at a young age, was put on a off-label antipsychotic for mood. I see this a lot, uh, you know, these, they have mood disorders or they're, they're acting funny. And, you know, the doctor says, well, you know, we could put them on Adderall or all sorts of things. Adderall would probably make you lose weight, obviously, but uh, maybe it's just some sort of mood issue and they're going to put them on a, an antipsychotic off-label. And someone argued with me that that doesn't happen. Well, there's a lot of data that that does, and I've actually seen it multiple times. So that, that does happen. That will make you gain weight through multiple mechanisms on um, appetite, maybe nutrient partitioning, et cetera. Which or, we can or even on-label use of like SSRIs. Yeah, so anything like that. And so, so was that a choice because the mood issues were coming from maybe just the parents were too busy working trying to make ends meet and didn't have time to maybe do the parenting. Again, I'm not shaming people. This is just life that, that happens. And so then you go on and eventually you see someone like Steve, who's, who's very lean, had the, the proper epigenetic and genetic propensity to be lean and also had the habits reinforced from childhood and you say that guy works extremely hard he's disciplined and then you see someone like joe who has this obesity and who went through all these different things we don't know a story but this is what you see when you see somebody and you just said that person's lazy right that so that's so some of these biases i try to get uh get people really thinking about we don't know these people's stories yeah sure maybe maybe someone just doesn't care um and 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 maybe they don't mind having that obesity. Maybe they have some laziness, but you know, it's, it's a lot more complex than that. And then when trying to lose weight, again, these, these things, those, those cytokines or adipokines, these hormone, uh, hormonal milieu, as some people say, uh, may be preventing us from them losing the weight that we already gained. And so then people are like, you're just not trying hard enough. This person's tired. You know, as you, 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 you have the energy blueprint. These people are fatigued. 
and, and then you're telling them they have to prepare their meals, you have to go out and do all these hours of exercise when they just don't feel well to do it. Um, it so it's, it's, I try to get people really thinking about that to try to empathize a, a little bit. It's hard, I mean, I, I've, you know, I'm trying to actually gain weight right now and that my body's fighting me from gaining weight. So I can only imagine how frustrating it is for someone that has a lot of weight to lose and their body's fighting them so hard to not lose that weight. Just to clarify, you're talking about gaining muscle mass. Yeah, I'm trying to gain muscle mass right now. And, and you know, by doing that, I'm trying to eat more and more. And uh, I'm actually not doing as much cardio, which is a bad idea because I, I feel better talking about energy wise when I do have that in my um, uh, regimen. But yeah, I'm trying to, but it's my body's fighting me. Appetite, my appetite's going down. Whereas people that are trying to lose weight, their appetite goes, gets cranked up high. Yeah. Due to some of these hormonal changes uh, and adaptations. Yeah. And, and um, you know, I think that's a, that's a good point because part of, I think what ties into this whole idea of, is it a choice? Is it just gluttony and sloth is this whole concept of the body fat set point system. And the mm -hmm. fact that we have regulatory mechanisms built into our body that are, that are controlling all of this. Yep. So, yeah. So, yeah. So this, this, the whole set point theory is basically, our, our bodies want to keep us in this homeostatic stasis, right? Our bodies want to keep us in a certain range, just like our bodies, our, our kidneys work to keep our, our blood uh, pH at a certain level, our, our, uh, our sugar levels at a certain level, our thyroid at a certain level. All these things have checks and balances. And for some reason, what happens when we gain weight, uh, for some people, not everybody, again, this is a, 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 an individual thing. For many people that gain weight, their body uh, set point resets at a higher level. So when the body starts, when you try to lose weight, the body fights it with all sorts of different things, appetite being one, uh, subconscious, subconsciously not moving as much, uh, not fidgeting, not taking as many walks that you normally would. These things all fight to keep your body from losing more weight and then to make it regain that weight to keep you at that higher set point. Um, and so someone like you know me or maybe even you, someone that's trying to gain weight, our bodies are fighting actually to then keep you at that lower weight. So it's really interesting. Again, this is very individual. It doesn't happen for every single person. Um, and then there's some more complex stuff like hedonic obesity versus metabolic obesity basically changes in, in the brain that, that override these things. It gets really complex, but uh, it's, it's some cool stuff. Yeah, well, actually, let's go into that for a sec, because I, I agree, that's a really interesting topic. Um, yeah. So can you explain this, the difference between hedonic and uh, metabolic obesity? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll try. So this guy from Yale, I, I've, I've read his papers a few times over the past few years. It's a relatively new concept, and I've seen him lecture a few times. Uh, I'll send you some of the papers afterwards if you don't have them already. But basically, uh, and I wish I could show the graph on, on the paper, but uh, the people they have a certain set point, but they're able to gain much, they're able to gain the same amount of weight that someone that has the higher set point, but their body's at, their body is trying to fight them. Their metabolic rate goes super high um, to try to fight them, to bring them their, their weight back down. But there's, there's a dysfunction in their brain, this, the reward pathway. So I'll, I'll just explain the reward pathway real quick in the simplistic terms. Uh, think about after a meal when you've, you're super full, right? You think you're full anyways, but then you still want that piece of pie, right? Or, or something really sweet, even though you're like, you know what, I'm full, but I, I, for some reason I can eat a few cookies and, and whatever. So that's kind of that reward pathway, the, the wanting uh, of food, the, the whole dopamine um, um, center. Uh, mesolimbic center. So what, what happens is that in this hedonic obesity, there's, there's dysfunction there. So even though your body's fighting you in ways to ramp up your metabolism to try to get you to burn more calories, there's so much dysfunction that you're able to overeat that. Whereas somebody that has metabolic obesity, their set point is up at that level. So like someone with hedonic obesity would have maybe the set point of like you or, you or I, but they're able to overeat that. And, they, and overcompensate for that. Whereas somebody with metabolic obesity would just, their metabolic rate wouldn't be such that uh, it's trying to overcompensate. They're set at that new point and they're just eating and, and burning as many calories as, as, as what the set point is showing. Again, so, I, I, 
yeah, it's hard to, I'm not that great at explaining. I wish I could show the graph that, that he shows on his, in his papers. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just rephrase in different words so maybe people can get a, a different yeah. perspective on it. But basically, it's like somebody who's, who, who is very overweight, uh, has a lot of overweight, yeah. and um, <laughs> their body fat set point system, the system of brains and, and certain brain regions uh, in correspondence with certain hormones, is regulating their new fat set point at that higher level they're kind yes. of their body yep. wants to maintain that versus yes. um let's say someone who's leaner um who basically is just in a state of chronically overriding their set point because they're being driven to consume more food based basically based on the pursuit of highly rewarding highly pleasurable foods that just they they they're, they feel compelled to eat more to give themselves pleasure and the end result of consuming excess fuel over time is accumulating more body fat. Yep. And yeah. And so their bodies, yeah, exactly. So they're, these people are the same exact uh, weight, but the person with hedonic ob obesity will have a much higher metabolic rate, but because their, their brain is, is there's something dysfunctional in that reward pathway there, you know, cakes, you know, you name it, cakes, pies, uh, cookies. Um, but, but their body actually wants to fight them to get them back down to where they should be, but their brain is overriding it. So now, it's very cool stuff. Now, question. I, I, um, I'm actually interested in reading these studies because I think you're yeah. alluding to a couple I haven't seen yet. Um, but I've, I've seen some overfeeding studies that they've done. I think like James Levine has done mm -hmm. with – even there's been some overfeeding studies with, with identical twins. And just yeah. so people understand, overfeeding basically means they take people and they forcibly – have them over consume calories with the intention to get them fatter. Right. Um, and so in these studies, what I remember them determining was that, that meat, um, non-exercise activity thermogenesis was actually the, the critical factor between whether people actually got fatter versus whether they stayed lean. And, and what that means is basically that certain people genetically seem to be wired in a way where they're where they'll burn off excess calories just by kind of spontaneous little movement throughout the day, just moving and walking more. Whereas certain people seem genetically not wired to do that very well, and then they end up accumulating the excess fuel as body fat. So I'm curious: is it is it actually um, is it actually a true increase in metabolic rate, or is it neat? Yeah, yeah. So you'll 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 enjoy it because it talks about the resting metabolic rate, and so the way that you can kind of and again, I haven't done this in, uh, with all my patients. I, I send some of them to, a, to get a metabolic cart just to show them that their metabolism is working. Because a lot of people think, I just have a slow metabolism, and yeah. they don't. You know? <laughs> but, so you can actually get them, get them to do one of these metabolic carts. They're, they're off by maybe 10% you know, or some, sometimes. But like, what they'll actually see that, oh, they actually have a normal metabolism. So what you could do is to see if they have this hedonic obesity you would you would check and if their metabolic rate is actually much higher than what would be predicted uh based on on the slope of this curve i'll sh uh, and i'll send this the, the graph to you yeah we'll put it they, in the links for the for the yeah, show notes. It's it's really cool. so if their if their <laughs> metabolic rate is much higher than you would expect you'd be like wow they actually have some reward pathway dysfunction meaning they're just out eating their their body it's, it's fascinating yeah. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely excited to check that out. So um, with, with that in mind, with, I, you know, you kind of a, have alluded to this kind of energy imbalance yeah. as being at the core of fat gain, um, yeah. but you've also explained that it's complex and there's lots of layers to the story and it's not just simply, uh, you know, gluttony and sloth. So, you know, some people listening to this might hear that and be like, oh, well, this guy's just saying it's all about calories in, calories out. Um, but I thought it was about hormones or, or mm -hmm. carbs and insulin. So let's, let's get into some of that. So what, what do you say to someone who's coming from that perspective? So they're all interrelated. It's, it's, it is still going to come down to an energy balance. The hormonal differences will drive that, though. So there, there, there was this hypothesis. So that, that was the calories in, calories out was, you know, the hypothesis for a long time. And then in the past you know, 10 or 20 years or so, there's been this, what they call like the insulin hypothesis of obesity. 
And so what they thought was that uh, people that eat more, so I'm sure you've explained to your listeners how the physiology of insulin and glucose works basically. A little bit. We did one podcast a few weeks okay. ago. So basically, yeah. So basically when you ingest something that contains carbohydrate, it gets broken down into basically sugar or glucose in the body, your pancreas, uh, the, the organ in the middle of your your belly basically senses that and sends out this stuff called insulin. The insulin then goes to um, like a, a key to a lock or, or I say a key to a truck of some sort in your tissues, which would be your adipocytes or your fat or your muscle cells. And it uh, goes into the insulin receptor, which is, you know, we call it the ignition. The ignition then opens everything up to where these sugar trucks come out and then take the sugar into the cells. So that's how it's supposed to work. So, um, uh, and then in, in people with insulin resistance, we say that the ignition, the batteries are dead in the sugar trucks or something like that, and the trucks don't come out um, uh, to get the, the sugar. So, um, uh, what were we talking about? The, the <laughs> Basically, carbo- insulin oh, hypothesis. Yeah, so yeah, okay, so yeah, so the thought was, so when people eat more carbohydrates and they have more insulin. They, the thought was because insulin itself is what is called a fat storage hormone, it, um, it stops what this, this uh, enzyme ca- called uh, hormone-sensitive lipase. Hormone-sensitive lipase is this enzyme that uh, breaks down your fat and allows it to go into your blood so you can burn it off. It also is supposed to upregulate this enzyme called lipoprotein lipase. This is an enzyme on your, on your fat and, and on your muscle that basically uh, turns on to, to, to then grab the fatty acids out of your blood and then either store them in the fat or, or get them into the muscle where they can be burned. So with that in mind, so the idea is more insulin means less fat release and more fat storage. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. All right. So... So then the thought was, well, then if we're eating, if we're having more carbohydrate in our diet, um, uh, then we're going to have more insulin. And with more insulin in our diet, we're just going to be storing more fat uh, and, and releasing less and burning less fats. It sounds, sounds interesting. So, so when you, the, thought, the, the analogy is that I've heard, because I actually almost got indoctrinated by the, a lot of the low-carb doctors, I, I hung out with them. Um, when in medical school, I went and rotated with many of them. Very, you know, smart people, well-intended you know, people. But um, once you get in, ingrained into a certain dogma, uh, you, you become uh, blinded a little bit. So the analogy was is that think of a pickup truck, and your gasoline is is the fat, right? So you think about taking gallons or or, uh, storing gasoline in those you know portable gasoline storage bins things or whatever those things are called but you throw them in the back of the pickup truck you can't use them you're not putting in your gas tank so you're actually storing these uh, other things of gas but you can't actually use it that's the idea of of what is happening when you have a, a high carbohydrate diet you're storing more but unable to tap that the the energy which would be the fat cells does that make sense so far Yeah, absolutely. So it turns out, I, I, hey, I, sound great to me. I went after, so I wrestled in, in college and I was a heavyweight. I wanted to lose a lot of fat. I, I was a relatively lean heavyweight. I still had, you know, you could still see my abs are a little bit blurry, but I was big. I was like 260 pounds, technically with a BMI, I had obesity. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, technically, but I mean, not, you know, I didn't have the disease of obesity, um, but uh, so I went low carb and I lost a lot of weight. It made sense to me. It just made sense, this whole idea of insulin and, and carbohydrates, you know, preventing you from losing weight. Yeah. So, and, I, and I, real quick, I was indoctrinated into it for, for many, many years and I taught it to clients of mine and, uh, yeah. and it, it does make, make sense. I mean, if insulin, you know, we know it has these kind of fat storing functions and carbs boost insulin levels. I mean, it's, it's only logical that carbs have this very... Uh, critical role in determining how fat or lean we are. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, the story is is amazing. And so when you start, and you can start getting these graphs and showing, look, people are eating more carbohydrates, and 
and, and sugar and these things are spiking insulin and look, these people are gaining and this is why the obesity epidemic. The, the problem is though, it's easily testable. You can actually test this in a, in a very controlled metabolic lab and that's my friend um, Kevin Hall had the most recent one and luckily Kevin Hall lives near me. He's this, he's this brilliant uh, uh, metabolic physicist uh, that comes up with these studies and and works in this metabolic lab at the NIH. He lives real near me. We get together and I'm able to learn from him. You know, I'm a clinician, not a, you know, in-depth researcher like he is, but it's, it's really cool to, to kind of learn a little bit more about it. But he actually tested this and there have been multiple tests like this. They basically kept protein the same um, and then they just changed the ratios of, of fat and carbohydrate in two different groups. And what they found is that, yes, yeah, certainly those people that were eating more carbohydrates, their insulin was higher. Uh, and then the people that were eating fewer carbohydrates and more fat, their insulin was lower. Uh, they found it just really didn't really matter so much. Uh, the people with more carbohydrates still lost fat. In fact, they may have lost more because uh, they weren't ingesting as much fat. Now, fr from a clinical standpoint, I, I don't really, it's, it's clinically irrelevant. But the, the point is, is that what that actually helps us uh, do is help people find a diet that they will be able to stick to for long term that doesn't necessarily um, mean they're eating very few carbohydrates or very few fat you can kind of help somebody uh, figure it out for them now where i come in is where is is the biggest thing and it's appetite appetite and some of these other hormonal changes are, are what's going to ruin somebody's diet. Uh, it's not the carbohydrates. I, I have patients that go on, they eat 10 carbohydrates, but they just, they drink butter and they do all these other things to basically get a ton of fat. That, and they, they eat, don't- That eat 10, 10 grams of carbohydrates? Yeah, 10 grams of carbohydrates per day. And the rest of it comes from fat and protein. And they still are unable to lose weight. And the reason is, is because there's still an energy imbalance. They, they, you can't overcome the physics. Now, I wish, you know, and even Kevin Hall, you know, you talk to them, talk to him. It's not like he, he doesn't have a, everybody thinks he's like, you know, paid by sugar, you know, <laughs> the sugar is to big, big sugar, big pizza, you know, all these different, some carbohydrate lobbyists. But, yeah. you know, I honestly, the me if, if, if a low carbohydrate work, uh, diet worked uh, um, for every single patient, I would just be pushing it so hard, you know, a, a ketogenic, uh, very low carbohydrate diet. But when you start looking at it practically, most people can't stick to it. And then in the end, it really doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, what I want to do is find those things, those hormonal changes that fight people from losing the weight, which has to do with the appetite, trying to get people, despite the, their environment, to then choose the foods that are going to um, not be rewiring their, their reward pathway in their satiety centers in their brain. That's yeah, you, you know, that there's so much in what you just said. I want to unpack that a little bit. for. People. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Um, you made a, a transition there pretty quickly and it was like a transition that you made that, that I happen to know because I, I follow a lot of this research for many years. I know that there was like, literally like thousands of studies informing this little, these little few sentences that, that you just said. Um, but you basically switched. You're like, basically carbs and fats don't matter. So like, <laughs> and, and, and you basically brushed it off in like two seconds. So <laughs> I, I just want to back up because a lot of people listening to this are like, wait, that's it. You know, I mean, cause there's been dozens of books, maybe hundreds of books, yeah. thousands of articles online written on carbs and versus fats and this being the yeah. critical thing and it's low fat versus low carb. There's been literally decades of debate on this subject yeah. of low carb and low fat. And basically what you just said is that, and I'll put it in slightly different words, is that based on this overall body of evidence that we know from testing this very, very thoroughly in controlled metabolic ward settings and in long-term diet studies, um, basically, in the end, it's clinically insignificant. There's just very minor differences between diets that differ dramatically in terms of carb and fat content. Would you yep. agree with that? that? Yeah, that is that is correct. Um, so I know if you know somebody's listening, they're like, "Oh, that's that's crap." I the only way I was able to lose weight was on a low carbohydrate diet. I don't, I, you know, I'm sure that's probably correct. What what eventually what what happens is that you're just you're able to 
stick to that. Something about that is, is allowing you to stick to a lower energy diet. It's likely um, uh, a low carbohydrate diet. If you do it correctly, like a, a low carb Mediterranean diet, you're eating mostly vegetables and some protein and maybe some fruit here and there and, and, and getting some olive oil and nuts, things, things that are very like very good for you and, and very anti-inflammatory. So think about that. Uh, and if you, if, if you were to eat more legumes, higher carbohydrates from like things like legumes that are actually lower in fat, they'd probably be fine. Where people get in trouble is that a lot of these high carbohydrate foods that you really think of, they're not thinking of legumes or, or lentils. What they're thinking of is pizza, donuts, uh, things that are likely higher in carbohydrates and fat and just super high in calories. And so like, it's, it's actually hard. I, I've tried to do one of these very low fat type of diets. I actually don't like it. I, I go back to more of a, a, you know, it's more like a zone type of diet. It's, it's kind of mixed, but it's, um, it's, when you do a low, a very low fat diet, it's actually hard to follow. And if you did it, you you would probably lose weight. It just wouldn't be very tasty. I don't think things taste dry. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But um, um, yeah. So uh, but, there, there's another ahead. aspect to this that I, I'm going to unpack because you're basically you're you're kind of you're basically saying like all this hubbub for a few decades around carbs and fats mostly nonsense, mostly insignificant in the grand scheme of things. But the, the real key is not the carb to fat ratio of the diet, it is, is dietary adherence. So what is the type of diet that, that you can actually adhere to and sustain for long periods of time while being in a calorie deficit that will help drive fat loss in a sustainable way? Exactly. That's, I mean, that's that in, and this is what, you know, my practical clinical uh, experience has shown. This is what the, the studies show that there's a, there's a really cool, huge trial. And this is where a lot of the obesity doctors and uh, researchers get their data. It's, it's called the look ahead study and also the diabetes prevention um, uh, program. And w when you, when you look at it, you know, it's really people who are, who are somehow adhering. And there's other studies too, the pounds lost, um, A to Z trial, and, and all these things that tried to change uh, the different macronutrients, change the ratios of, you know, the, of protein, fat, and carbohydrates. And really what they found is that the better you can stick to these diets, uh, one of them, the, the better you're going to do. And actually, so there's one thing out there that people say, well, then you should pick what you would rather do. So if you prefer lower carbohydrate foods or higher, higher carbohydrate foods, you should go with that diet. Well, there is a, there's a few studies in the past couple of years that actually they randomized people to either ones that they preferred or didn't prefer. And then they kind of switched them up and, and things like that. And it actually didn't matter. Oh, interesting. <laughs> it is interesting. Yeah. But, but so if you like something more, you may eat more of it. There are lots of little things here. It's, it's going to come down to somehow – developing these strong habits to eat in a certain pattern that it, that's you, you're going to have to enjoy it a little bit. You can't be miserable. If you're miserable, you're not going to be able to sustain it. Right. If, but if, if you like it too much, you're going to end up eating too much. So there's a fine balance. Somewhere. It's, 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 it's a tough thing. Cause and, I, then, and then if you have, you know, something like keto, I know you mentioned that so few people can actually sustain it for, yeah. for the time. I mean, there's other issues there, whether that's not even that relevant to whether you like it or not, but just like how compatible with the modern world is it? Like, can you go to a restaurant and yeah. find keto meals? And it's tough. Have so, you done a ketogenic diet? Have I? Yeah, I've done it for short periods. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, I, I find it miserable personally. It is. So, uh, you know, I've done I've done pretty much every single diet out there just because I want to know what my patients are experiencing. So it was interesting. Ketogenic diet is really hard the first week or two, uh, but then and I, I I tanked. I couldn't even run. I couldn't bike. But I I became fat adapted. What everybody says, you know, you go through that keto flu or whatever you want to call it, and I. I was, I all of a sudden had a lot of energy. The problem was social events and all sorts of other things. It just, yeah, you know what? I want some toast with my eggs in the morning. A little, just one, you know, one slice. I want some extra fruit here and there. 
I want, uh, I want some oatmeal. I want some pasta once in a while. Um, you know, so it, it, it becomes something that's just like, you don't have to follow that in order to lose weight. Um, I will say that we don't, we don't probably don't have time to get into type two diabetes and all that. I, I do put people, if they are on a lot of insulin and their pancreas is pretty much teetered out, um, uh, I do put them on ketogenic diets to get them off their insulin if possible. But other than that, I, I don't find it necessary to go on a ketogenic diet. Well, that, that's another thing that I really like about your work is that you're not dogmatic about here's the one true best way to eat, the one right way, and everybody else is wrong. You, you, you actually are of this perspective where like it's really about dietary adherence and finding the best healthy pa dietary pattern that you're going to be able to sustain and let's work with the individual patient to find what that dietary pattern is. And sometimes that might be keto. Sometimes it might be, I would imagine, you know, maybe a low fat vegan diet or, yeah. you know, somewhere in between a zone type diet or a paleo type diet or lots of different variations. And you're not dogmatic about that, which is really cool. Yeah. I, I say I'm a nutritional agnostic or whatever, which yeah. I, you know, you, you know, if every, if everything, uh, you know, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail or whatever you want to call it. But, um, yeah, I try to, cause I mean, patients will do all sorts of different things. I mean, you know, a lot of the fitness people will, will, will knock the paleo diet, but it's like, I've had a lot of patients that, you know, love the, they love the paleo diet and, and it's not like they're following it 100% to a T they, it's their paleo wish. So they're eating a lot more fruits and vegetables, you know, things that we all know are, are good for you anyway. So uh, anything that will get them to do it and get them in and then maybe you teach them later what, you know, what's really going on and that's fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, there's so much I wanted to cover in this and I know we're not going to have time to get into everything I wanted, but um, I'm trying to think, do you have, Maybe, do you have any other kind of keys to fat loss that you think are really important? Um, and, and maybe we could get into some other non-nutritional areas and maybe exercise or maybe some of the other areas that affect fat loss. Yeah, so from, so, okay, so we've established that, you know, you can lose weight whether you're eating carbs, carbohydrates or not, whether you're eating fat or not, because uh, that was the old thing. You had to eat low fat in order to lose fat. Well, that's not true. Um, so we're, it does come down to energy balance, but it's more complicated than that because your body's going to fight you and it's hard to actually eat. It is hard to eat less and move more. It's hard to actually do those things. So the way that I actually help people do that is realizing that appetite is probably the main thing. So when I help somebody set up a, a, a fat loss diet, of course they have to be, they do have to be eating less, right? But in order to make that happen, we focus on, the things what we call are, are, are not very energy dense. They have a low energy density. And that means that they fill up more volume and they have fewer calories in them. So think of like uh, spinach. You could eat a whole bowl of it and still, I don't know, it's like 10 calories, you know. It's, it's very few calories, yet it's very filling because it'll fill up a lot. Um, uh, it'll, f it'll fill up your stomach uh, with, with very few calories. So you start focusing on those types of foods. Uh, and, and also like leaner proteins. Uh, protein's very satiating and doesn't have as many calories. And it actually, you burn a little bit more. It's, it's, you actually burn more calories trying to digest protein than you do um, other types of, uh, of calories. So we try to do more leaner type of proteins, low fat, dairy maybe, um, and a lot of vegetables and fruit. And then beyond that, then, then you, so you, you kind of figure out their, their current diet and you say, well, look, if somebody's drinking a frappuccino from Starbucks in the morning and eating a muffin, it's pretty easy to start making a switch there. But if they're already eating a relatively um, healthy diet, then it, it gets a little bit more complex. But basically starting to form them into what they prefer, but again, not to too much of what they prefer and focusing on that energy balance to basically take care of that appetite, uh, um, uh, energy density as well to, to get them there. It's a, it's, it's a complex process, but with each patient, you try to go that route and then just tinker in, uh, with it. You can get people to count calories. Uh, you can get them to weigh their food and maybe get an idea of what portions really are. That can be good for people, but some people don't do well with that because it's tedious. And if they're tired, as we talked about, uh, that's just one more extra thing that they're just not going to be able to do. 
one thing I do is a lot of meal replacement shakes and, and even prepackaged meals, which sounds counterintuitive because it's like, that's not real food. But studies actually show that when you start taking the choices and guesswork out of, of some of their day, uh, people are able to lose more weight than if you tell them just to eat whole foods in every single meal. So what I do is a protein shake just replaces one of their meals, uh, say lunch, you know, and from a practical standpoint, somebody goes to, uh, you know, they're at work and their colleagues go, all right, let's time to order lunch. And you realize you should have packed the lunch if you wanted to lose some weight, but you didn't uh, because it takes time and, and effort. So then you, you and your colleagues go and get Thai food or Chinese food or grab some pizza. Instead, you can replace that 800 calorie or 1000 calorie meal with a 200 calorie protein shake that Maybe not as filling as a, as a whole foods meal with salmon and broccoli and maybe a boiled potato, but it does the job and it takes the guesswork out. And what happens, people are able to lose weight quicker in the beginning, gets them motivated, gets them feeling good, and then you can start teaching them the strategies to be able to uh, maybe prepare the food. But if people aren't feeling good and, and they don't have that energy, that if you try to just tell them to eat you know, lean proteins and vegetables, it doesn't work so well. So making it super easy in the beginning, uh, it works. And there's a lot of data to show that um, that work. People get mad at me for, for recommending protein shakes instead of whole foods, but there's, there's too much data to, to ignore it. And I'm not saying drink protein shakes forever. You, you do that in the beginning to get them feeling good. And then so then they can start doing those other things. Yeah, and I, I think there's also probably some power in the monotony of it and the, yeah. and the lack of choice like yep. just just not having the novelty of like options of different yep. things to eat kind of my theory on that is like it helps retrain the brain out of hedonic eating it's like true. you start eating like oh i'm just gonna have this protein shake this is not a particularly pre pleasurable thing it's not pleasurable it's not really unpleasurable it's yep. just i'm having the fuel to fuel my body and gives it give it what it needs um, but it's the eating is not this experience of like, I sit down and what am I going to order to, you know, kind of give my brain all these, this pleasure yeah. chemicals. It's just like, oh, I just have my fuel. It's 12 o'clock. Yep. I'm to have the fuel. Yeah, you're exactly right. You know, if, we don't have too much time to go into it, but if you want to look up, there's something called sensory specific satiety. And that's part of what you're exactly what you're talking about. The less variety and getting into that monotony actually retrains your brain. And then as you lose the weight quickly, there's less inflammation and maybe less dysfunction in the brain to then allow you to then have fewer cravings, actually, which it seems, seems like, oh, yeah, if you diet, you're going to have more cravings. But actually, people that lose the weight, they have fewer. And it may be because of the, the, the inflammatory uh, response is going down and creating less dysfunction and improving the brain function and, and the communication with the rest of your body. Mm -hmm. The other thing I like is um, something called acceptance-based therapy. It's, it's this idea is that we should just, we should uh, accept what we cannot control uh, and control what we can. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, accept that our bodies are going to be fighting against us, accept that we're going to get some of these cravings, uh, but realize we do um, have, have control in that moment. And so uh, when, when you, and then accepting less pleasure, right? there's a lot of fitness people out there and fitness fanatics and people listening probably have experienced this where, yeah, just, just eat an apple instead of, instead of eating that candy bar. Duh. It's like, what? And they're like, yeah, apples taste amazing. Fruit tastes amazing. Fruit tastes better than that cookie. And it's like, well, no, that's, that's not true. If you've ever had a really <laughs> well-baked, perfect chocolate chip cookie or whatever your favorite, whatever your go-to like crazy, like favorite snack is, you realize Nothing will ever compare to that. No fruit, no vegetable ever. But if you change your mindset to, to thinking, I'm going to accept less, I know this is going to be less pleasurable, but it's not, it's not, un, it's not unpleasant, right? It's, it's still fruit. It still has some sweetness, but I accept that this is not going to be pleasurable compared to the, um, compared to whatever that is, French fries, cookies, cakes. Uh, but I'm going to do it because it aligns with my values and what I value. And that's, you know, you get into not a goal, not I want to lose 50 pounds, but no, I want to be there and, and, and be able to uh, enjoy life with my children. That's what you value. And you, you accept less pleasure uh, to then uh, have your values align 
um, with that behavior. It's a very cool thing. So when I teach my patients that they're not just like, yeah, have the apple instead of the cookie. No, you accept that the apple, yeah, you can have the cookie every once in a while. You, you don't put it on a, a restrictive list. You, you realize you can have that cookie once in a while, but you're gonna accept less pleasure in that moment and still have some pleasure because it, uh, that uh, behavior aligns with what you value. And that's, a, that's the basics of it. And it works, there's a, I call it a landmark study. They compared uh, using that acceptance-based therapy to standard behavioral therapy. And the difference was about 30, it's like a 30% or so uh, efficacy difference, meaning wow. yeah, 13% weight loss or 13 and a half versus like, 9.8%, which is still very good, but um, they, they, they had some better mechanisms. They, they accepted this less pleasure and realized, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that is a key change. And I, I also think that the human brain is not wired to do that very well. I think that the human brain is very wired to assess things in the moment and say, wow, cookie, donut, yeah. that looks delicious. I want that pleasure in my face, you know? Yeah not wow cookie donut um if i make this momentary decision to have those things it might influence things 10 years 20 years from now where i might not be as functional not be able to play with my kids or grandkids um our brain don't, our brains don't think like that right naturally and i think you have to cultivate the skill of thinking like it, that. it is and so this is where i the other thing is and the listeners probably have heard of like sugar addiction and and you know food addiction i'm, I'm a carboholic right and so a lot of the fitness professionals go look there's no evidence for sugar addiction right well you know the people that say yes there's a sugar addiction because it lights up the same parts of your brain than as cocaine and some of these things and then you know the People um, on the other side, the fitness professionals say, no, there's no sugar addiction. It's just a, a correlation. It, of course, it's going to light up the same part of your brain. If you hug a puppy or anything like that, it'll light up. But there's no, it doesn't, um, it, it's not an, a true addiction. They'll pull up studies. But when you start looking at it from a clinical, from a clinical picture, people are driven that way. And when you start looking at some of the mechanisms in the brain, there is an overlap. It, I wouldn't call it an addiction. I'd call it addictive-like substance for certain people that have dysfunction in the same parts of the brain. Um, so I think for, it doesn't help to say, nope, you're not sugar addicted. But I think it, it helps to empower people go, yes, this does have addictive-like properties, but we can overcome it. It's not going to be like overcoming a, a meth amphetamine addiction or something like that. But it does have, you validate what they're, they're feeling, but then you say, then you empower them, if that makes sense. So it does. Yeah. And, and I actually happen to agree with you in that kind of middle ground yeah. between the two extremes. I, I yeah, I, I disagree with a lot of people in the fitness community that are like so opposed to this idea. And I think they're not in touch with the, the, the reality for people who do have some of that hedonic dysfunction going on that these foods do really trigger them to go on binges and kind of lose control. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's tough. Well, so I know we're pretty much out of time here. Um, the last thing that I want to ask you is just what kinds of um, different medical complications might a person have where they might need assistance from you? I know you do some online doctoring now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm, I want to encourage people to reach out to you if, if they need help. But what kinds of scenarios would you recommend for people to, to go and actively seek out that help? Right. So if somebody's trying to lose weight, this is, this is where the classic things, people can hire a trainer or anything or uh, maybe an um, online health coach. And maybe they lose weight and they do fine. But I, most people, what happens is they they're trying to uh, lose that weight. Maybe they did and then they regained it. Maybe they failed multiple times. Um, maybe they just don't have enough energy and, and, and they just don't feel well. So that's where you know, I take this clinician's hat and go, all right, somebody with sleep apnea, untreated sleep apnea, I screen it in every patient. It's very common in those with obesity. And by the way, real quick, it's actually super common in people with chronic fatigue syndrome. Yep, There's some research yep. showing it's like roughly almost 50% of people with chronic fatigue syndrome. Exactly. So when people have that and it's not treated with a, a, a CPAP machine, they will not, it's true that losing weight may reverse it or may, you know, lessen the severity, 
but they will not have enough energy to do so. Uh, so treating, if you're just not, if you're like, I just, I'm trying to lose weight and I just I can't, I'm just tired, I can't do it. I'm, my hunger is ridiculously elevated. Uh, I just don't have enough energy. That's when going to a doctor would be a good idea. And just going through it, talk about it. Are you snoring? Are you gasping in the middle of the night? You know, maybe, no, maybe you just never talk to a doctor about it, but that's something I, I, everybody should be talking about or screaming for. The other thing is like for guys, um, you know, because of all these things, uh, your testosterone can be low. And so in some of those people, maybe treating with this, you know, if you have sleep apnea, your testosterone could be low, getting them a CPAP, getting them to feel better, getting them to lose weight can increase the testosterone. Sometimes it's so low and it's from the obesity and maybe the insulin resistance that giving them a little bit of testosterone back as, as, you, as, the, as you help them to lose weight will come back. You know, some of these things are, are you know, they're all interrelated. Depression and, and, and uh, this can be a, a, a bad cycle as well. Thyroid, I'm sure you guys talk about thyroid. I, I always screen every patient. It's, it's, it's unlikely that there's a thyroid issue in people with obesity, but it is something you don't want to miss because they'll be pissed <laughs> if, if you miss that. You know? <laughs> Um, uh, so, uh, and yeah, probably diabetes as well, right? Yeah. So, and, and, and diabetes as well. And, and, you know, that's kind of what we talked about the insulin resistance and inflammation that will make you uh, more tired as well. But so the, the thing is, you know, you start, you, you go through all these things. It doesn't seem like they have this, but your appetite is still high. There are medicines that work at the certain receptors in the brain, uh, that control your appetite and there's multiple receptors. Uh, and I do some lectures on this, but there, there are different options for medicines that wipe out that appetite or at least may assist in that appetite so that you can stick to a diet. They're not fat burners. So people are like, oh, it's a magic pill. It's going to make you lose weight. It's, no, they basically allow you to then adhere to the diet plan to, mm -hmm. instead of just going, oh, my God, I just want that brownie, that cookie. There are actually drugs that work in the mesolimbic center in the brain, the, the reward pathway to, to have to basically wipes out those cravings when you have dysfunction there. And it may take a few different types of drugs or maybe a, a combination, but that's what I do. I, I, I help uh, look at that, look at all the causes of, of fatigue and what's stopping you from losing weight. And then I try to assist. And some people, if they have, you know, if they qualify for surgery, if, if, if we fail conservative treatment and we go that route, but that's, that's end of the line. Uh, usually. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Dr. Nadolsky. It's yeah, been for an having me. pleasure. And to everyone listening, I, I really want to actively encourage you guys to seek this out because, you know, sometimes I have people on the podcast that I don't necessarily know their work that well. Sometimes they were just recommended to me. Sometimes it's just kind of a, the first conversation with people. But um, with, with Spencer, I've been following his work for years now. And he does really awesome work. He's putting out great content. And I know that he's really paying attention to the science. He's going to all the latest obesity conferences. I mean, he's, he's really on the cutting edge of how to do this well. So if you're struggling with fat loss and you have some of these different medical complications, I really highly encourage you to seek out his help. So where can people reach you? Uh, so you can go to drspencer.com or, or on Facebook. You can just search for Dr. Spencer Nadolsky. Um, I'm on Twitter as well. And then, you know, obviously I have my, you know, I do online um, doctoring, steadymd.com slash D-R-S-P-E-N-C-E-R dot uh, doctor slash Dr. Spencer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. Really a pleasure to have you on and uh, I look forward to maybe a part two. Yes. Thank you. Awesome, man. Take care. See ya.